All right. Hi everyone, um, my name is Isadora. Thank you so much for um, coming tonight for the data and dialogue session. Um, this session is hosted by Chicago Studies, which is a program of the college that works to help students forge genuine bonds with Chicago's diverse communities through classes, programs, and really cool events such as this one. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Isadora and I'm a member of the Chicago Studies Student Advisory Board. And I'm also, um, a big fan of cycling in Chicago in my free time. Um, tonight's session will be with Christina Whitehouse, who's a founder of Bike Lane Uprising. Bike Lane, Bike Lane Uprising is a cyclist-led civic tech platform focused on making cycling safer by making it easy to report bike lane obstructions and finding trends in the data to hold violators accountable and prevent future obstructions. While many miles of bike lanes exist in Chicago, they're often blocked by drivers that use them as free parking. By creating a central database of bike lane obstructions, bike lane uprising highlights problem areas and trends in bike lane violations. And they then work with local organizations, city departments and companies directly in an effort to prevent future bike lane obstruction. I first came across their work um, on Twitter in an episode of rage scrolling after a really frustrating bike ride home on the Halstead Avenue bike lane. And I've been a really big fan of their work ever since. Um, the session is part of Chicago Studies ongoing climate and city series, which focuses on Chicago's local response to the global climate crisis. Um, and it is now my pleasure to introduce Christina Whitehouse. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I am the founder of Bike Lane Uprising and um, I'm very excited to be able to share just, you know, some of the stuff that we've been working on, just maybe provide like a overview of what bike lane uprising is, some of the data that we're collecting, you know, some of the things that we've been able to do. Um, bike lane uprising was a little bit of a surprise to me. I wasn't actually expecting this to become a thing. So, but here we are and there you are and um, very exciting. Um, I will say that this was a happenstance. I just want to point this out. So. I didn't mean to do that. Um, all right, so let's get started. Um, all right, so we're gonna talk about what Bike Lane Uprising is. Um, Isadora did an amazing job, um, how we got started. Uh, I'm gonna teach you guys how to spot a bike lane obstruction, uh, very exciting. Uh, we'll talk about the data we collect, what we've actually accomplished and um, the ways that you can actually make biking safer and then ways that you can support our work should you be interested. All right, so Bike Lane Uprising, as Isadora mentioned, we're a crowdsourced civic tech platform. People download our app and they can document bike lane obstructions. All of those bike lane obstructions go into one central database. We then map everything and do data analysis from that. Uh, I started Bike Lane Uprising as a little passion project. I actively tried to hide it on the internet and it went viral. <laughs> Uh, I, at one point in time, my friends had no idea that I was doing this and all of a sudden it just ended up on the nightly news every single night. And, um, you know, I was starting to get text messages from friends that was like, is this you? Like, why are you on the news right now? <laughs> um, and it just, it, it spread. It, I didn't expect it to become a thing, but it is a thing. And, um, you know, we, um, it's volunteer based. Um, most people don't realize that, but uh, we tend to look bigger and scarier than we are. Um, we have a lot of volunteers that are very good at what they do. They're very smart. They're very passionate. And because of that, we tend to look a lot bigger than we are. 
Uh, it, it was founded in Chicago by myself um, with just things that I had hobbled together. Um, I am not a developer. I come from the design background, hence the sign, design. Um, and I just found some, you know, like low code, no code things and plug them together. And it was enough to inspire disruption. And that disruption just kind of caught attention online. And I also didn't know how to use Twitter. So our Twitter account is actually pretty uh, popular and I am actually somebody that doesn't really use social media. So the fact that, you know, we learned how to use, you know, Twitter for this and, you know, it, it did so well, um, just kind of like spreading awareness and it actually started to get attention as you can see here. Um, you know, going into this, I thought, hey, like, am I gonna get in trouble for making this database of, you know, like license plates? And I was like, I wonder if the city is gonna like get mad and reach out to me. Well, the city has reached out, but they've also asked me to like present at things and ask me for my feedback. And so it's a very different type of scenario. Uh, pretty, pretty strange if you ask me. Um, so now on for teaching people how to spot bike lane obstructions, this is a bike lane obstruction. You can tell because, you know, it's a car in a bike lane and it doesn't fit. Um, also, it's green. Also, there's a, you know, a bike symbol. Um, you know, uh, this was actually a rather uh, uh, famous bike lane obstruction from our database. Uh, I do think it's entertaining that there's um, this like ad here that says, um, do you have a teenager? Because it's like almost like, you know. <laughs> I always found that kind of uh, interesting, but not all of them look like this. Not all of them are this obvious, um, but some of them are pretty egregious. And um, this is a bike lane obstruction. This is actually the Department of Transportation blocking the bike lane when there was actually enough space to park legally. Um, and you can see that they don't really seem that worried that they're pushing, you know, cyclists into traffic. So, you know, CDOT, as you know, in case anybody's not familiar, they're actually responsible for making bike lanes safe for cyclists and all road users. Uh, so why is it a problem? You know, the reality is, is that there's only a small percentage of streets that have any designated space for biking whatsoever. And the, the bike lanes that we have are, you know, they're being used as free parking, extra driving lanes, construction sites are illegally taking them over. Um, they're making it unsafe. They're, you know, being used as distribution centers by large corporations. So instead of paying for a distribution center, you know, large semis are just using bike lanes to actually like move product from one, you know, semi to another. Um, and they're not being safely maintained. If you go on social media right now, especially in Chicago, you're gonna see uh, that the bike lanes just don't get cleaned in the winter. And you know, the bike lanes that are uh, protected bike lanes, they're even harder to use in the winter because all the snow gets pushed into them and they just never get cleaned out. And it piles up and it piles up. So you know, as an example around Chicago, uh, the bike lanes haven't been cleared. It hasn't snowed in quite a few days and now we're getting another snowstorm. So the chances of them getting cleared now are even slim to none. All right, so how did it start? I was almost run over by the driver of the truck in this photo. Um, I was downtown Chicago, I was biking to the Merchandise Mart, I was on a divvy and I was in the Franklin bike lane and a, that this driver actually turned so sharply, he was coming up to the red light, I was stopped at the light, uh, he was turning so sharply onto, uh, uh, I think it was like, uh, I forget the name of the street, but anyways, he was turning so sharply into the, onto the right uh, to turn right outside of Franklin uh, in, under Lake. That's what it was. And then uh, he actually turned so sharply that he actually went onto the sidewalk to my right. Um, he started to almost pin me under the back wheel. So I was actually using both of my hands to push myself off of the side of the truck to prevent myself from going under the back wheels. Uh, if anyone's used a Divi or a share bike in other cities, they are heavy bikes. They do not turn that fast. Um, so, I mean, I was in the process of getting pinned. So luckily I didn't go under the back wheels. Um, and I just remember having this flash, you know, thought to where it was like, he didn't see me and I wanted him to know what had happened. And I thought, Hey, like, I want this guy to be able to drive safer the rest of his route. So I chased after him. Uh, and I caught up with him right as he was about ready to go under lower whacker. I uh, was able to get him to roll down the window. 
And I very calmly asked, I was like, do you realize that you almost ran me over? And he stone faced, no emotion said yes. And then he took off again. And I assumed that he didn't know. I assumed that it was, you know, an honest mistake, uh, you know, a, you know, a lapse of judgment or whatever, but he knew. And he had driven away knowing that it had almost happened. And I tried to get a hold of the company that this person worked for. I tried to um, get creative. Uh, every time I tried to reach out to them, they never let me get past the receptionist. And, you know, so clearly they knew what had happened, but they weren't that interested in that, doing anything about it. They didn't really want to know what had happened. Uh, two weeks later, uh, Virginia Murray was killed in an eerily similar circumstance. Uh, turning truck comes up on the left of the cyclists and runs them over with the back wheels. And it was something that just kind of stuck with me. I, uh, you know, continued, um, you know, just, I kind of stopped biking for a little bit. Um, and then I went back to grad school that fall uh, in a place in Evanston. Um, and uh, uh, one of the students at Northwestern was actually killed um, that year um, within like a week or two of classes starting. And it was a foreign exchange student. They had just come to the country and they were killed biking right outside of the building. And so, you know, I passed by that student's ghost bike for the rest of, you know, my time at Northwestern. And, it, you know, it's something that just kind of stuck with me. And I, you know, I realized that just that the ecosystem of trying to do anything about unsafe drivers, bike lane obstructions was just incredibly fragmented. There just wasn't anything there. And, you know, I come from the product development background, um, design development, and I realized that there's, you know, the technical opportunities are there to be able to actually do something about it. And um, I tried. So, and again, this is Virginia Murray. Um, I've actually had dinner with uh, Virginia's mother. So one of the times we were doing a, a human protected bike lane um, after a cyclist was killed, uh, Virginia Murray's mother saw it on the news and actually reached out. Um, and since then we've had dinner and talked quite a few times. Um, so the reality is, is like bike lanes don't often look like this. I started to do research and, you know, I, I realized that there was just this opportunity that, you know, existed. And once I got done with, uh, once I graduated from professor and I realized that, you know, I was like, oh, I'm just going to like reach out to people. Cause I could see that there were like people that would like post about this online. And I could see that like people were actually doing like a really good job of like documenting the data and the facts. And it was very like objective. And I kept on getting this one quote over and over and over from everyone of like, I feel like nobody cares. I feel like nobody cares. I feel like nobody cares. I just kept on hearing it over and over. And because of it, at that point in time, people were taking matters into their own hands. Um, they were smashing cars. Um, I mean, there were some pretty uh, notable altercations that were happening between drivers and cyclists where, I mean, like people were getting like, critically injured, hospitalized um, fights that were taking place. So, you know, coming from design and development, the reality is, is that the, the more you actually understand the problem of something, the more opportunities you have to actually solve it. Um, and I really like the problem and I really like getting to know the problem. So, you know, my theory was the more we get to know the problem of block, blocked bike lanes, we can identify unique solutions to actually improve them. Um, so far, we've collected well over 35,000 bike lane obstructions. Um, and again, this is something that started with Airtable. <laughs> I made this off of Airtable. Um, people told me that you couldn't do it. To this day, we are still using Airtable for some things. So I'm here to sh share that, yes, you can. Um, don't get in the way of people that are actually getting something done. Um, uh, now, 35,000 bike lane obstructions might sound like a lot. It's definitely just a drop in the bucket of how many bike lane obstructions are actually taking place. This is really just a signal to the noise, right? Um, and for context, about 35,000 bike lane obstructions is about over $5 million in unrealized fines for blocking bike lanes. It could actually be more than that because a lot of them are construction sites and construction sites are actually fined by the thousands. So this number is actually 
pretty conservative. So imagine what this number could actually be. Um, and again, think about all the companies that aren't paying for distribution centers and taxes on distribution centers and all of these other things that are taking place. Um, all right, so what we do with the data. You know, somebody signs up, they become a contributor to our database, uh, they submit a bike lane obstruction, and we use that data to visualize the problem. So just like, let's at least create a visual record of what happens. Um, and what you can see here is these are areas that people have actually signed up and started submitting bike lane obstruction. So this little thing that I started right here, um, actually in this apartment, um, spread via word of mouth outside of Chicago. Um, people from other cities asked to join and it just kind of kept spreading. Um, we do cluster maps, we do heat maps. Um, you can do, you know, pinpoint maps. You can filter the maps. You can, you know, say like, okay, well show me um, this city, but only show me municipal bike lane obstructions. And then also I wanna see uh, bike lane obstructions that are, uh, have construction issues or, you know, you can kind of switch between um, cities as well. We have a few cities that have a higher proportion of submissions. So you can kind of switch between them, see like the percentage of types of bike lane obstructions as well. Um, what's interesting is by capturing the data, you can actually see some trends. So if you go to like municipal bike lane obstructions, and if you actually zoom in on this area and you keep on zooming in and you keep on zooming in, uh, you see that there's like a hot spot of municipal bike lane obstructions like right here. And if you actually click on some of those bike lane obstructions on the website, you can see that there's a Dunkin Donuts there. And if you click on some of those bike lane obstructions, you can actually see the police walking into the bike lane, uh, they walking out of the bike lane uh, where they've left their cruiser and going in and getting Dunkin Donuts. So what we've been able to do is we've been able to show that, you know, this devil's advocate thing of like, well, you know, it's probably an emergency. Oh, it was probably this, oh, it probably wasn't. Well, our photos are showing, yeah, not so much. Um, oh, and look, there was actually legal parking right next to it that people are choosing not to actually park in. So when you filter our maps, you can actually like, you know, get it down to like different obstruction types, um, percentages. This is um, some data from 2018, but you know, you can go on and, you know, see the latest and the greatest. It updates like every two hours or something. Uh, and we can also start to look at like, hey, how does our city compare to other cities? So once you like start clicking around, um, you can see like if there's more company obstructions in some or, you know, and it, again, it's going to be based off of who's submitting and who's, you know, who feels it's typically the more egregious the bike lane obstruction, the more likely it's going to be submitted to the, to the database. Um, uh, we've also become this thing that was like this gorilla bike lane app thing that like actually started to get attention from city decision makers. Um, and, you know, the same way that you've invited us to present tonight, you know, we have been reached out to by other very important departments and city decision makers. Um, it used to be that, you know, we used to really try to get meetings and, you know, get um, you know, city decision makers to acknowledge that we existed. And then it started to turn into city, like, like aldermen uh, reaching out and asking if they could meet with us. Um, so it's like kind of flipped a little bit. Um, but our work actually um, teed off a, an investigation by the Office of the Inspector General. Um, specifically into bike lane obstructions created by city employees as well as the lack of maintenance on bike lanes. Uh, we've met with the Department of Finance, um, you know, transportation providers, uh, you know, various companies, um, and then quite a few like biking groups um, and just bike organizations just in general. Um, it's been a very interesting ride, that's for sure. Our data, you know, there was one day that, oh, if you look at the dates here, you can see July 18th, we had a list of the top spots for bike lane obstructions that made it into NBC. And July 25th, they actually put up ballers in the same spot. So, you know, we are, our data is leading to infrastructure. Um, you know, it, we actually found a loophole in a law that actually prevented people from, or offering a loophole for them to get out of ticket if they bike or if they park in a bike lane. So we did a workshop with the city of Chicago and we uncovered that if you simply drive away 
before um, uh, a city official places a ticket on your windshield, if you're parked in a bike lane, you actually don't, you didn't have to pay for it um, because the ticket physically had to be placed on your windshield. So if like, you know, you saw them walking up or if the ticket was already issued, but you just drove away beforehand, um, you could get out of it. Uh, but that has since been changed. Again, um, Office of the Inspector General, this is the, you know, the item that they had placed in their, um, their investigation plan. And has anyone read an investigation report from the Office of the Inspector General? If you think our Twitter account is spicy, their reports are way spicier. <laughs> if they had a band t-shirt, I would wear their band t-shirt. It's very entertaining. Um, we also uncovered that the 311 system was broken. Uh, the 311 system had been redesigned and uh, it cost the taxpayers $35 million and it had been broken for over a year and nobody realized it. So our data actually uncovered that bike lane obstructions um, as well as, you know, the one, so there's bike lane obstructions that are kind of your garden variety bike lane obstructions to where it's like, yes, you know, I already knew that the city didn't do anything with them, but there were some bike lane obstructions that like required the city to actually act upon it and do a, like a service or, you know, maintain it or fix a pothole or clean it or, you know, clean snow, something like that. Those should have actually kicked off work. And um, our database actually proved that that wasn't taking place because people actually identified if they submitted it to 311. And we went through the database and we reached out to people and asked them to provide the, the analysis of, you know, like, hey, what type of a response did you get on these particular um, submissions? And they went through and they, you know, said that they had been closed or it said it had been open for like four or five months or over a year. And um, they just hadn't done anything with them. So this episode aired on WTTW in 2019. It's my understanding that nothing has changed. Uh, we've also um, kind of, you know, going into this, I, I wasn't anticipating the volunteers. I wasn't anticipating that people would you know, one, want to admit that they submitted to our database, um, but that was wrong. Um, I also didn't know that people would want to volunteer, but I was wrong on that as well. And, you know, we've, we, one night we noticed that there were a lot of people in 2020, the summer of 2020, that were biking without lights. And, you know, I'm pretty big on lights and, it was like, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could just like buy lights and just give them to people? Like, wouldn't that be cool? Um, and we were hoping to have about a hundred sponsored. And we were like, well, you know, we wouldn't give like promotional bike lights to our friends. We wouldn't allow our friends to bike with like promotional bike lights. So we don't wanna get promotional bike lights out. We wanna give like actual really nice bike lights out. Um, so we, it caught quite a bit of attention. And I think, so we ended up getting like a hundred or 200 sponsored. We received them and we started to give them away out on the street and we started snapping photos and we started to post those photos on social media when we were out on the street giving away bike lights. And we tended to pick nights to give away bike lights when there were presidential debates going on because we just didn't want to sit around and watch TV that night. And I think the juxtaposition of what we were doing really caught a lot of attention. And so far over 2000 sets of USB rechargeable sets of bike lights, meaning a front and a back bike light um, have been sponsored. And it started in Chicago and it just kind of keeps on spreading to like other cities and stuff too. So um, it's been really entertaining to watch. Uh, it also kind of became this yearbook of people who bike. And it also kind of became this like yearbook of people that often get forgotten about when we talk about cyclists, um, people that are, you know, biking home from work from McDonald's or people leaving the taqueria at midnight, you know, we would give bike lights out to, and we would go hit up Randolph street and give them to all of the couriers. And, you know, just like, I mean, we would go like hunting for people that we thought might need bike, like bike lights. And it just became like this very like 
jovial type of experience. Um, a lot of people that have been a part of like the bike light giveaways have stated that uh, the bike light giveaways were like the highlight of their pandemic, just giving them away and like being on the like the giving portion of that. So pretty interesting. Um, we also noticed that we could spot um, repeat offenders with our database. So we, in 2018, um, Angela Park, who is the mother here uh, of these two girls, she was killed in uh, the West Loop. She was uh, like a triathlete. So very experienced cyclist. And um, she was killed at a construction site on Halstead. Um, so Isadora, I believe you mentioned that you had an issue on Halstead. Halstead is not that safe. And um, a construction site had illegally kind of started to like, kind of just like take over the intersection a little bit. Um, and that often happens that they'll just start taking over sidewalks. They'll start taking over bike lane, it becomes hard to see. Well, um, Lakeshore Recycling actually ran um, Angela Park over and killed her. As soon as I saw the truck, I actually recognized uh, that truck because it was a repeat offender in our database. And, uh, whoops, sorry. So at, you know, that year they had, you know, blocked the bike lane about 17 times. And that was with like, just like 12,000 submissions to our database. So that's pretty high. Um, but also the, like the weekend after Angela was killed, they were actually getting pretty aggressive with cyclists. So when they were blocking the bike lanes and rolling through, you know, stop signs, literally the weekend after one of their coworkers had killed someone on a bike, um, they didn't care, you know, the time that you would have thought that they would have been on their best behavior. It didn't, it didn't do anything. So we also realized that it was just oftentimes hard to, you know, do like to spot, you know, like commercial vehicles and like identify commercial vehicles just based on the way that they're marked and all of that. So we've actually kind of created like a little bit of a spinoff um, thing to help us help identify vehicles. And um, it's called Uprise. It's something a little smaller. We're, you know, still trying to like kind of figure out what we're doing with it, but essentially we are aggregating our data with a lot of public um, data sets and we're talking very, very large data sets and the resolution of our data paired with these other data sets that don't actually talk to one another and they're not actually that easy to use and they, you know, they kind of expire after a little while and it's just not that easy to use. So um, more to come on that, um, hopefully within the, you know, the near future, but um, yeah. Um, all right. So how you can help making help make biking safer. So I think first things first is please don't park in bike lanes. Um, that's the number one. Tell your friends not to park in bike lanes. Tell your aunt not to park in bike lanes. Your aunt probably cares more about what you have to say than what I have to say. I can guarantee it. And if you're, if you are a cyclist and you are telling your family members, please don't do this. Like it actually is unsafe for me. They're going to care much more about that. And then if I tell them that when they're parked in the bike lane outside of my house or something like that, um, reduce your speed while driving, don't drive in bike lanes, um, give cyclists three feet when passing. If you can't give them three feet, you shouldn't be passing. Um, and then ride your bike. There's really, you know, there's a ton of power and safety in numbers. And the more people that bike, the you know, the more apt other drivers are to like remember and kind of like realize that they need to be paying attention for other cyclists. Also, it's one less car. Um, all right, so recap, now you know who we are, you know how we got started. I taught you how to spot a bike lane obstruction. Um, so you got that now. Um, you know, the data that we collect, you know, the ways that you can help make biking safer. And then, you know, obviously there's ways to support bike lane uprising as well. Um, we, you know, you can download our app, you can, um, you can follow us on social media, you can, you know, we have merch, things like that, and you can volunteer, all sorts of stuff. Um, here's some of the social media handles if you need it. I'm gonna move this out of the way too. Um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I think we still have time and, um, does anybody have any questions? I can go ahead and like moderate the Q&A if anyone wants sure. to raise their hands or put any questions in the chat. Um, and while we wait, I just have one question um, sure. right off the bat. 
which is what do you see as like the ideal relationship between cars, cyclists and pedestrians? And what do you feel are like the structural or policy kind of steps that need to be taken um, to really achieve that ideal relationship? Um, one, I think that tension is at like an all time high, you know, I think we've all heard the, you know, things are turned up to 11. Well, it feels like it's up to like 25 right now. And it, it, it feels like things are very, um, like, it feels like drivers are really aggressive right now. Um, as I mentioned, like I bike in other areas and, you know, Chicago, especially like, it feels like drivers are like trying to hit cyclists for sport right now. Like, I'm not even joking. It, it, it's aggressive. So one, I mean, cyclists just like need safe spaces, you know, like we shouldn't have to, you know, fight and, you know, intermix and, you know, jump into a bike lane and out of a bike lane and, you know, all of that it's, it's chaotic. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, so design should be intuitive. You know, the reality is, is that bike lanes, there really isn't one standard for bike lanes and it's chaotic for cyclists. Even if you are like an experienced cyclist, think about how bike lane design changes from, you know, like block to block to neighborhood to neighborhood to city to city. And like, it's hard for, you know, a cyclist to, you know, even like keep track of where the bike lanes are. Imagine somebody that's never even been on a bike. They don't care. They like, it just doesn't even register to them. So we need just like bike lanes that keep people away from being underneath a car. Um, and that's just the reality of it. And I think if everyone kind of gets their own little area, it, it really reduces some of the chaos and there, you know, a lot of that tension is going to go down. But right now, I mean, it feels like things are like a powder keg really getting ready to explode. Chris. <laughs> I, I would really be curious, Christina, to hear a little bit more um, some of your kind of comparative data. So obviously, I, I think any of us who bike in Chicago, we have at least a little bit of a sense of kind of the sorts of struggles that we're encountering here. I'd just be curious to find ways in which Chicago is, is an outlier in comparison to some other major biking cities in the country, or maybe ways in which we are disturbingly and depressingly typical. Yeah, um, it's sometimes hard to tell that, you know, because Chicago just has such a strong following. So we tend to just see so much more, like if something happens in Chicago, I mean, like I hear about it and I hear about it quickly. So there's that, um, but then also there's a lot of familiarness, like a lot of like the structural issues that we're having, you know, the having to really be on top of all of the public meetings and this and that, and, you know, just, it's exhausting. And that's something that, you know, people that drive don't really have to do. You know, if I'm driving my car, like it feels like the city makes it easy and safe for me. If I'm in my, like on my bike, which is my preferred mode of transportation, it feels like people have gone out of their way to make it more dangerous for me. Um, and that's something that I think is just like across the board, you know, being experienced in different cities as well. Um, so like looking through the, the database feed, you can actually like scroll through and just kind of like see like just like carelessness, like complete carelessness of like, you know, city officials putting the drive slow sign in the bike lane and like, you know, just like, just like complete, like just somebody almost had to go out of their way to make it as bad as it was, or, you know, just like really like pitiful bike lane design, no, you know, like no um, protection whatsoever. And, you know, it's just, it's across the board. And just like no enforcement, no upkeep, no warnings, no anything. And unfortunately we've, um, we've helped organize uh, human protected bike lanes, not only in Chicago, but in other cities too. Um, so oftentimes we've done them after somebody's been killed. We've also, you know, I think the reality is, is like take ghost bikes, for example, ghost bikes are white bikes. Um, they're bikes that have been painted white and kind of decommissioned and they're placed at the scene where um, a cyclist has been killed. It's a little bit of a way to one, remember the cyclist, uh, but also to kind of draw attention to the, you know, the safety concerns of that location. 
kind of hope that it could be redesigned so that it's safer. Um, those bikes are everywhere. And I think that that kind of gets to the heart of, you know, we're all kind of experiencing the same issues and, you know, with like COVID and the, the driving habits that took place during COVID, um, you know, I think they said that like road user fatalities were up like 18% or something, just like within a year or two. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's huge. And Chicago has seen an all-time high of cyclist deaths. So in, in 2020, we saw an all-time high. And then last year, we saw an all-time high. So the number just keeps on going up and keep on going up. And we've actually taken on um, quite a few of uh, the builds for the ghost bike lately. So the fact that we have to buy spray paint in bulk and the materials in bulk says something. Evan, you can go ahead. Hey, sorry, sorry, I was late. Um, and sorry, I've had my camera off. I'm take, taking care of a future cyclist here. Um, Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm just wondering, um, you, you know, uh, sort of public information campaigns like this, and, and I think the, the ghost bike thing is also sort of a public information campaign. Uh, does that, you know, have any impact on the kinds of people you were describing, like the the people who work at the construction site who like just don't care or are even kind of like proud of, um, you know, running over a cyclist. I mean, what's the, it, it, it seems that people who have that kind of attitude can't, can't be shamed into, you know, driving more safely. Um, so what do you, what do you think the approach is? I think, Honestly, I think butts on bikes is probably the, the best approach. Um, it kind of forces agency. So, you know, one of the things that we work on is to volunteer at, you know, biking events in neighborhoods that aren't always that well known for being big on biking and really kind of exposing people to one, you know, what it's like to bike and one, it's fun. It's like, they're usually like festival, you know, type of environments. It's like a very fun, um, gorilla, you know, kind of approach to it. Um, it's teaching people how to bike. It's, you know, a lot of the times bikes are given away to people and it kind of allows people to see, Hey, it's not actually that easy to stop on a dime. Hey, like you actually do have to swerve around glass and potholes and things like that. And, you know, you can't just like, you know, like you exist and, you know, and then people can see the difference between how awesome it is to bike with a group and then, hey, it's not actually that easy biking there and back. Why isn't that, you know? Um, and why is it that, you know, people are so aggressive when we're not in this group, but, you know, they are when it's just me. Um, you know, we're starting to see construction workers biking and getting scooters and, you know, like there's nothing more that like makes me so excited when I see a construction worker go by. I actually had a photo of a construction worker in this deck to where you could see this um, cement mixer coming on one side of the road and you could see this uh, construction worker on a divvy coming this way. And the, the cement mixer was actually a company that I had yelled at probably three months prior for blocking that same bike lane that this construction worker was going to be biking in. So if, you know, like those two worlds are starting to collide and the more that you have people invested in being a part of, you know, like having some skin in the game, the more that likely they're going to want to do something. Um, you know, my own family, like, doesn't bite. So, you know, I've had family members come to Chicago and the first thing I do is get them a bike and we bike around the city. And, you know, they've like, that's been a very new experience for them. And I've asked them, I was like, you know, you've been to Chicago before. How does this compare to, you know, what you would have done? Like, would you have been on a bike? Like if you are driving in the city, do you think that it, your driving habits would change? And they said, yeah, like they, they wouldn't drive the same way that they had before because like, it's a very, like they've seen the city from a very different perspective. So, you know, it's about 
trying to let other people see, you know, like the need as well. And that's kind of, you know, the, the statement about like, you talk to your aunt, like, I'm not joking, like talk to your own family. And the more that we're all doing that, you know, there's people that actually submit to the database that don't bike, but they have like a kid that bikes or something like that. And, you know, like they see this as something that makes their, you know, family members safer. I think that, you know, one of the things that is often talked about as well is that all of the biking gear, it, um, it oftentimes kind of dehumanizes people. And a lot of people tend to not see that there's a person underneath it all. And the more that we kind of, you know, it, I mean, it sounds kind of disturbing to say this, but the more that we let people kind of like realize like, yeah, that's me. Like I am that person, you know, um, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I heard, I heard an amazing lecture at uh, APA a few years ago um, against bike helmets for exactly that reason, because, you know, helmets kind of send the signal that biking is something dangerous to only be undertaken by people who are, you know, prepared to crash at high speeds and that kind of thing. So it was, it was against helmet requirements um, for exactly the reason you're describing, which, you know, um, is an interesting argument, you know. <laughs> Apparently people are on dating apps telling people about bike lane uprising. So apparently that's been happening too. So people are spreading the word. Nice. I have um, another question about, I guess like if you could talk more to the idea that you um, had mentioned about like how different there's like an, there's like an image of what a cyclist is and how a lot of, a, there's a lot of people like you mentioned, like the worker at McDonald's or the, um, you know, courier who's picking stuff up in the West Loop, like how those are also cyclists. And I was wondering if you could talk about maybe like the different neighborhoods that you see on the app, like being reported, um, or maybe just like the type of, um, I guess like, you know, like how, how you've seen, kind of seen that play out um, with bike lane uprising and like having different types of cyclists, I guess, like being involved. Yeah. So one, there's a lot of stereotypes in biking. Um, and I think you're kind of touching on that. Uh, it tends to be viewed as the tech bro, you know, like aggressive and aggro type of thing. And you have your like crazy expensive bikes and, you know, just the Lycra and like that's who bikes. And because of that, people think that other people don't bike and that it's not used as transportation and that it's not, you know, you know, people that need to get somewhere important or, you know, um, and, you know, to be quite honest, I didn't feel that welcome within biking when I first started this, like, I didn't even have a bike until 2020. So like, I was just using Divi. And I think, you know, my take on a lot of it was that it always kind of felt like, you had to be perfect and you had to wear the right things and you had to have your socks a certain height and you had to do this and you had to do this. And it just like, it just seemed exhausting and it didn't seem very welcoming. So one of the things that I always say is like bike lane uprising is aggressively welcoming to people. And, um, and I think it shows, it shows in the, the people that follow us on so social media it shows in where bike lane and bike lane obstructions are being reported. Obviously, bike lanes per capita, you know, kind of are going to fall in certain neighborhoods versus others just based on where the bike lanes are. But what you're seeing is like, it's really like being like evened out and like we're attracting a lot of different types of people. And we're kind of showcasing that like, yeah, like if you ride a bike, all bikes are cool, you know, like. I want a trike to tell you the truth. Uh, I really want a trike. Um, <laughs> and like, it's not about being aggro. It's about like going to the beach. It's about, you know, just whatever you need to do. If you want to go to the grocery store, whatever, like all those types of, you know, situations are important too. And it's not just about this like aggro kind of thing. And, you know, one of the important things to, you know, take away is that like, biking is actually really a great way of like democratizing transportation. Um, Chicago in general is so incredibly segregated. We all know this. It's like a very obvious thing. And, you know, the transportation modes are, you know, very like hard to get to if you're in certain neighborhoods and, you know, transportation is not evenly spread out and it's hard to get to places. So, 
access to opportunity is really hard. And if you are tight on funds, biking is one of the cheapest ways to get access to opportunity, to get to school, to get to the doctors, to get to the grocery store. We have food deserts, we have all sorts of things. And, you know, a lot of people that are tight on funds will tend to bike because it's actually affordable. Um, it's cheaper than taking the train or the buses and it's sustainable and it allows them to get through areas that like there wasn't a bus, you know, route or a train route as well. So they're able to, you know, get access to maybe a job that they wouldn't have been able to. But again, um, one of the, it's, it's a little harder to showcase while, well, you know, with COVID and everything, cause we've tried to not really have too many events and stuff, but, um, one of the things that always happens when we have events is people always comment on like how diverse our group is. Um, I mean, like if you have, if anyone's been to one of our events, like, I mean, you get just every type of cyclist, you get every type of bike. I mean, it's just like, you get the low riders, you get the fancy bikes, you get the, we have a high following of tandem bike riders as well. Uh, I mean, just like, you name it, we have it. And um, it's always like commented on by the people that like, you know, host our events and stuff too. Um, and I'm really proud of that because, you know, biking, you know, in around Chicago really didn't seem that welcoming. And to know that like so many like diverse groups feel so comfortable, you know, just like being a part of it and they feel that they are a part of the uprising. That's really cool. Christina, maybe a follow-up on that. Um, I, I'm really curious, you talked about some of the sort of policy work and kind of advocacy work that you've been doing. Mm -hmm. Where has Bike Lane Uprising or in what other constituencies has Bike Lane Uprising been kind of finding um, some maybe natural allies? Uh, what are there other groups that you find are kind of aligning quickly and on one issue or another with the, the work that you're doing? Um, I mean, it kind of, I mean, one, I think cyclists just in general are always going to like kind of get it right. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of untapped opportunity with like ADA compliance because like a lot of people, especially if like people use wheelchairs, it's a lot easier to use a wheelchair in a bike lane than it is on a sidewalk. So I feel like there's a lot of untapped opportunity there. I actually um, was a part of a panel with somebody from um, like, I think one of the disability groups and they, um, they also felt the same way that there's a, like there's way more that the two demographics could be doing together versus like trying to see like each other as like opponents. But honestly, I think like with the, the slow streets and everything that kind of came out in like 2020, um, it kind of showed a lot of people that like, hey, like things could be different. And that was like kind of the first time, like that was the first time we saw like streets without cars on them. And we saw like people not driving and how quiet neighborhoods were and like you could hear birds. And I mean, it was just different for like this like one little like period of time. And um, I don't know. Seems like there's an opportunity there. Kelly, do you wanna go ahead? Sure, uh, thank you. So I kind of have a question related to your like bike lanes uprising's relationship with the city. Cause I think it's really interesting how you've gotten, you've interacted with so many different departments but then you still see instances where like bike lanes are taken away. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit like how what a more ideal relationship would look like where it would, I don't know, and maybe it's lever, layers of bureaucracy in the government that has something to do with it, or like just kind of speak about that kind of relationship with the city. So I think if you take a step back and you kind of look at how Chicago's landscape and like streets are actually maintained, um, that's probably important. So you have multiple departments and you have departments that don't necessarily work well with one another. And then on top of that, you have wards and alders kind of manage their wards. And those wards are often have some very crazy boundaries that don't really make sense. And it's hard to create a connected network when you have, you know, some streets that are 
uh, the Department of Transportation, like the, the Chicago Department of Transportation's control, and then other streets that are the Illinois Department of Transportation's control. And then now you put a layer on top of it where like the maintenance would need to be either CDOT or the streets and sands. And there's, you know, kind of like arguments between those two groups. And then on top of that, you have wards with older, you know, people that may or may not appreciate bike lanes or feel the need for them within their wards. And then you have, you know, companies that, you know, live in that ward that, you know, might have um, more control and, you know, kind of say than they should have. So because of that, you end up with an incredibly fragmented bike lane system. And you, if an alder is pro bike lane, they will do stuff about it. They will try to get more bike lanes and they will try to main, they will try to use some of their menu money to maintain bike lanes and put, you know, skin in the game on their side. And then if you have alders that don't like bike lanes, they will try to have meetings, public meetings and not actually advertise them so that nobody knows about them except for the people that don't let the bike lanes. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a cat. So I guess I have a question. Um, had anybody heard of Bike Lane Uprising before um, Isadora had uh, mentioned this as an option? Um, me, I uh, mm -hmm. follow, like have like followed the uh, social media stuff for a while. Who is that? Sorry, can you say your name? I didn't see. Oh, sorry, uh, I'm Mark. Mark, okay. Nice to meet you, Mark. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, no, um, bike lane and uh, bus lane obstructions have been like a pet peeve of mine for ages. And I'm from New York where there is equally little, if not even less enforcement of, of bike yeah. and bus lanes. Um, and um, actually something in New York that I also think is true in Chicago is that we, um, you know, we need to make our bike, even our protected bike lanes are oftentimes wide enough to fit a car in them because the city doesn't want to invest in, in, in the sort of smaller format, uh, sort of snow plow and other equipment that you see in more bike oriented cities elsewhere. My argument on the, you know, the argument about the the width of the bike lanes because, you know, they need to be able to fit a plow in it is, well, why aren't there plows in the bike lanes then? Because, you know, they're just not yeah. being maintained. Um, yeah. So clearly that's not actually working. So are we going to just mm -hmm. get no time of the year where the bike lane is usable or are we going to get maybe one season and then kind of go from there? Um, the city of Chicago actually does own uh, plows that fit in bike lanes. Um, the, the reality is, is that the um, streets and sanitation are supposed to plow bike lanes. Um, streets and sanitation has said, uh, we are not plowing bike lanes if they are protected bike lanes. And since, you know, because of that, you know, they didn't want, you know, CDOT to build the protected bike lanes. And then CDOT has actually built protected bike lanes and it's mm -hmm. CDOT's responsibility to clean those on their own. And because of that, it just doesn't work. And because now you have two departments plowing snow, they're plowing it into one another. So like CDOT might actually clean the lane, but then now street and sand goes through and, you know, just dump snow into it. City that works. This is maybe a little I've learned so much. I had no idea about any of this when I started, just so you know. So my like level set of information was like goose egg. All of this has been learned just after digging into it. Uh, I just wanted to ask, you had said earlier that you were diving into those other data sets to compare data, but they were like kind of complicated and hard to use, but I was still just curious to know which databases you were using. Um, we're, we're kind of trying to figure that out right now. Um, but as an example, um, the U S department of transportation, uh, keeps records on all commercial vehicles. You have to get a US DOT number. And if you've submitted to our database, you, there's a thing on there that says like, Hey, you know, write notes or a US DOT number or things like that. 
um, we're working on ways to link some of that data. And uh, we have, so the US Department of Transportation keeps two years worth of records um, out there, it's public data. And uh, we have like eight to 10 years worth of data from that. So we're gonna have a longitudinal view. Um, like we're talking just like millions and millions and millions of data sets and, you know, pairing it with like other data sets that like don't really talk to one another. There's just gonna be like a much more complete view because some of the data with like the USCOT, it's just like really hard to get to and find. And then also um, you can't really search in ways that like a normal person would search. And then also um, uh, a lot of it is self-reported data. <laughs> And you're not gonna believe this, but companies don't always tell the truth. And our data kind of paired with that data, paired with other data, it's gonna kind of shake things out. Yeah. We have a question in the chat um, asking if there's anything, this is from Chris, um, looking at like this on a more international scale. Um, there's, there's challenges going international. Um, you know, every country has their own rules and stuff like that. So, um, you know, just sc like scaling anything, there's a lot of opportunities, there's a lot of challenges, and obviously you want to do it right. Um, you know, going into this, there was, again, there was no plan for bike lane uprising to be a thing. It was just like this itty bitty little passion project thing that I actively tried to hide on the internet. And then it just kind of spread. Um, and it wasn't really planned to go outside of Chicago. Um, I realized that it could, I was like, there's really nothing stopping anybody from, you know, submitting from outside of Chicago. Um, like I mentioned, there's like, there's people that like, when they travel to like different cities, they'll like submit bike lane obstructions to different cities. And one thing that we found is that, um, if you live in an area like if you were an international student or something like that, um, international students don't really like to submit um, things to the city because like they feel like it might look poorly on their stay here. And then also not everybody knows like which department they need to go to and all of that. So like a cyclist is a cyclist is a cyclist. And like if you bike in the city that you live in, more than likely you're probably gonna be getting on a bike in a different city. So it kind of is like this one kind of stop approach within like the US. Um, uh, we've also noticed that the people that submit to our database, um, I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but uh, there's two different, there's kind of a spectrum of people that submit to our database. There's some people that like very much like don't want to, you know, don't want anybody to know that they're submitting because they um, might not have legal status in the country. Um, but obviously they still deserve like having a safe route to get to where they need to go to. And then all the way on the other end of the spectrum is there's people that have too much status in the country and they don't want people to know that they submit. And then there's also the notion that if you submit to like 311, your data is public record. Um, so if you actually got into some sort of an altercation with that driver, if that driver, driver was being aggressive or something like that, if you submit your data, that driver can find your information. So if you put in your like, whatever that can be found. So um, people don't always like that either. Um, but there's just like a lot of nuances like that. Whenever you like build something, you just like don't know what you don't know what you don't know. And um, obviously there's just challenges. Actually, Christina, I was curious about it from the other direction. There's a lot of other countries um, that are way ahead of the United States in terms of their support of, of biking and the ways in which they've, you know, designed their urban centers, especially around the idea of, of self-powered transportation. I'm wondering if there's any models that of, of other similar like advocacy organizations that are maybe ahead of where the U.S. is that y'all have been looking at or have taken, taken note of. Um. It's kind of apples to oranges. Um, obviously, like the the advocacy groups, uh, there's like a whole underworld of the biking transportation advocacy groups. I'm just gonna be a hundred percent honest. Like, there's a whole like it's a whole thing. Um, I didn't realize that when I got into this. I just thought everyone was like, oh yeah, like we're here for like doing good and all of that. And um, 
you know, the reality is, is a lot of these um, orgs have funding attached to their work. And um, there's actually a lot of uh, don't, you know, don't tread on my turf type of issues as well. So, um, but at the same time, because of that, because a lot of the times the advocacy groups, their funding is actually tied to the cities that they're in, they tend to not really want to rock the boat too much with the cities that they are working in. So you'll see a lot of like, oh, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. You're doing a great job advocacy groups. Um, and a lot of that, I think, can be connected to the fact that their funding is attached to their advocacy within that city. Uh, and ours isn't. So we just say whatever we want. We probably have time for like one more question. If anybody has any closing, closing questions. Does everyone bite? I'll ask a question. <laughs> yeah. I noticed in the photo that you guys posted on Twitter that um, it was like not even related to biking, but I think you guys were doing something and there, like I saw bikes in the back. I was like, oh, no. So our, our dean, dean uh, who's been the dean of the undergraduate college for about 30 years is a super avid biker. Um, and he is fairly advanced in his seventies at this point, uh, but he bikes year round. He has a special like heavier than Divi bike that's just for biking in bad weather. I guarantee yeah. that despite strong advice from everyone who cares for him, he will bike to work tomorrow, no matter what condition. And he did a lot of bike tours uh, that we facilitate with him. And so there's a kind of a strong undercurrent uh, in Chicago. There's a nice strong biking culture um, that is closely tied to Chicago studies. So when Isadora brought this up, we were like, oh, we have to do this, yeah. you know? Wonderful. Yeah. Well, awesome. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that you guys invited me to um, present. Um, obviously, I'm in Chicago. So, um, you know, when events are a thing again, um, please, you know, come and say hi and all of that. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Sharing. This has been <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. I It is my fervent hope that we have at least a few BA theses that come out of just students being, as I am, obsessed with and wanting to dive deep data set. But if not, Mark Loeb, who was one of our prize winning BA authors last year and who's now working on his master's in public policy, I'm sure he'll do something brilliant with the data set because that's just the way Mark operates. So. <laughs> awesome. Thank Great. You. Thank you so much, everyone. Right. And have a wonderful night and get on the app. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We'll see folks at the climate series. <laughs> Look forward to it. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. All right.